Are you ready to hear about the Heian period, the golden age of Japan's empire? I've got a juicy history tidbit for you. So let's rewind the clock back to the early 8th century. Picture this. It's year 794, and Emperor Kamu decides to shake things up and move the capital from Nara to Heian, today's Kyoto, to get rid of all that heavy influence from Buddhism on the government. So he revives this old government system called Ritsuryo, which basically means lots of rules. He's all about enforcing these rules and making changes to adapt to the times. See, it used to be that they had to redistribute the rice fields every six years, but that was a pain in the neck. Therefore, one of the first things Emperor Kamu does is change it to once every 12 years. He's also really fed up with corruption among local officials. So he tightens the screws and keeps a closer eye on them. No more sneaky business allowed. And instead of randomly picking peasants for his armies, they start selecting sons of local officials who have some serious martial skills. This is the moment when the samurai warriors began to take shape, but we'll come back to this later. Like his predecessors in the Nara period, Kamu launches significant military campaigns against the Ezo, a tribal group in the northern areas of Honshu who were seen as aliens. It takes some time, but eventually, they bring those Ezo under control. But hey, even though the Ezo were pacified, the central government never quite had complete control over the northern border. Now, you might think that religion and government don't mix, aka capital change from Nara to Heian, but despite that, Kamu is all about balance. He's a big supporter of Buddhism, but he doesn't want religious authorities interfering with state affairs. So he makes this rule, hands off the government, but keep doing your religious thing. He even sends two super-talented monks, Seicho and Kukai, to China to study. These dudes come back and create their own Japanese Buddhist sects, and they build temples on mountains and become the cool kids of Japanese Buddhism. Now, the Heian period had this interesting social class system. On top was the emperor, who was seen as a deity, and his role was primarily ceremonial and religious. Then, the aristocrats and powerful noble families' clans held political power and they ruled. Below them was the warrior class, responsible for protection and military duties. Commoners made up the majority of the population, such as artisans, farmers, and merchants. Slaves, known as Hainan, occupied the lowest social status and performed laborious tasks. After Emperor Kamu gets off the throne, here is where things get sizzled. Despite all the official stuff looking all proper and organized, society starts going haywire. The Ritsuryo government starts falling apart because it's just too darn hard to keep up with the whole rice field allocation system. Money troubles, you know? And when the government's broke, things start to get chaotic. Don't forget to subscribe. Meantime, the aristocracy is living it up in style. The Fujiwara clan is at the top of the food chain and they're rolling in wealth and never-ending parties. They marry their daughters off to emperors, their sons become emperors, and everyone's having a big time, like in a real-life soap opera. The government is all about ceremonies and traditions, but behind closed doors, it's all about wearing the fanciest robes and throwing the best parties. While the rich and powerful are having a blast, the common folks aren't so lucky. Taxes are high, and things are tough. Private lands are popping up left and right, and the government is losing control. It's like everyone's doing their own thing, and the Ritsuryo system is falling apart. All this decadence leads to cool stuff happening in art and literature. Since their first touch with China, the Japanese are fascinated by Chinese writing and customs. At first, they adopt the Chinese character's kanji, but as time passes, they get creative and created their own writing systems called hiragana and katakana, known as kana. These kana syllabaries allow them to express ideas freely in Japanese, which is grammatically different from Chinese. This invention is a very important moment in Japanese history, enabling the production of a great amount of verse and prose in the national language, leading to the foundation of modern Japanese writing. So having written Japanese language, the aristocratic ladies are killing it in the creativity department. The Fujiwara family's daughters play a notable role, 
becoming emperor's consorts and surrounding themselves with talented women who excel in learning and writing. While men use formal Chinese and official documents, women find their voice through hiragana, a script they embrace for literature. Two famous works emerge, The Tale of Genji by Murasaki Shikibu, a groundbreaking novel that follows the life of Prince Genji and explores his romantic relationships and adventures, and The Pillow Book by Sei Shanagan. It is a collection of essays, observations, and anecdotes about court life, including descriptions of daily activities, personalities, and poetic musings. These books are important literary achievements from the Heian period, helping us understand insights into the lives of aristocrats and social dynamics, court traditions, and arts. In the Heian period, beauty and elegance are highly valued, and women play vital roles in the social workings of the court with surprising freedom. Marriages are arranged and polygamous, but despite that, women can initiate divorce and even remarry. Women of lower nobility become concubines to high-ranking men, using their skills in music and poetry to advance. Affairs are totally cool, and women aren't ashamed of it. They're respected for being worldly and have control over their liaisons. While the aristocracy basks in luxury and lust on their estates, an unstoppable force moves silently through the provinces, the legendary warriors, samurai. Now, let me make a surprising incision here. Women warriors known as Anamusha were an integral part of the esteemed samurai class. They fought alongside men like the legendary Tomo Guzan and archaeological findings challenged traditional notions, showing about 30% of ancient battlefield warriors were women. Let's pick up where we left off. These rising samurais are younger members of the imperial family and lower-ranking aristocrats who are too thrilled with the Fujiwara family having a monopoly on high government offices. So, they decided to take matters into their own hands and became local officials in the provinces. They built their own power, acquired lands, and became forces to be reckoned with. To protect their territories and expand their influence, they organized local folks, especially the Zaicho Kanjin, into their service. These local officials were no strangers to martial skills, which meant these warrior clans grew into formidable forces. As time went on, the powerful samurai didn't just stick to the provinces, they flocked to the capital, serving the state's military needs and acting as bodyguards for noble houses. They cleverly associated themselves with the aristocracy and gradually made their mark at court. Two warrior clans that stood out were the Minamoto, Genji family, tracing their roots back to Emperor Sewa and the Terra, Haika family, descendants of Emperor Kamo. These two families were no ordinary warriors, they had some serious street cred. The Sewa Genji even served the Fujiwara regents and gained fame for quelling a rebellion in northeastern Japan. Their leader, Minamoto no Yashi, became the nation's ultimate warrior, admired and feared by all. People were so impressed that they pledged their loyalty to him in exchange for protection. But the Terra family wasn't about to be overshadowed. They had their own rise to power, starting in the Kanto district. They extended their influence far and wide, but faced setbacks along the way. They lost control of the Kanto district due to some uprisings, but they didn't let that hold them back. They played their cards right by currying favor with retired emperors and building up their power in the western provinces. They even ventured into trade with the Chinese Song Dynasty, making some serious moves. These guys were power players, climbing up the social ladder and making waves in the nobility. Meanwhile, the courtiers at the imperial court and the Fujiwara regent's house were having their own issues, causing major discord among the nobility. It's like a medieval soap opera. Both factions sought the support of the Minamoto and Terra warriors, and things eventually came to a head in the Hagen disturbance. This was a showdown in Kyoto that settled major differences, but not without a whole lot of fighting. Spoiler alert, the warriors, samurais, proved that they held the real power. The Terra clan, led by Kayamori, emerged victorious and became a major force in Japan. This meant the end of the Fujiwara clan's monopoly over Japan. Kayamori wasn't born into nobility, 
but he managed to become a military noble and dominate the political scene like a boss. He was not an ordinary samurai of medieval Japan. He had his own suits of armor and a vision for the future. Kayamori and his family slowly gained power at court, thanks to their close ties with the retired emperor Go Shirakawa. Kayamori even became the prime minister, and his family members filled other important positions. They were running the show. Kayamori's daughters were even married into powerful noble families, and one of them became the consort of the emperor himself. But, as you know, power can come with consequences. Kayamori ruled with an iron fist, making some drastic decisions along the way. He exiled core officials, raised troublesome places like temples, and reshaped the political landscape. However, he wasn't all bad. He improved trade routes, including the Inland Sea Route, and fostered trade with Song Dynasty in China. This made the Terra clan wealthy and set them apart from the earlier Fujiwara regents. Kayamori was a visionary leader, making bold moves and leaving his mark on history. Of course, Kayamori's dominance didn't sit well with everyone. The Minamoto descendants quietly built up their strength in the provinces, plotting their comeback. Yoritamo, the oldest surviving son of Minamoto Yashitomo, emerged as the leader of the rebellion against the Terra clan. Japan was engulfed in all-out warfare for five years. From the initial uprising to the epic sea battle at Danura, known as the Genpei War, Yoritamo rallied warriors from all over eastern Japan and formed alliances to take down the Terra-led court forces. The Minamoto clan, led by Yoritamo, won and established a military government in Kamakura, known as the Bakufu War Shogunate. It was like a whole new era. The Bakufu held political control for centuries, shaping Japan's destiny until the restoration of imperial power in 1868. Oh guys subscribe now to discover more of the wild twists and turns that shaped our future.